Indian sepoys on the Western Front during the First World War, often praised, sometimes derided. Were they lions in the trenches, or did they fail the big test against the Germans? Were they terrified by artillery? Did a huge number deliberately wound themselves and could they operate without command and control from their British officers? These are all thorny questions and one which we will be examining closely today. To discuss the topic, I'm joined by friend of the show, David Snape. He's written a book called A Tiger Loose on an Ice Flow, all about the Ferrers Poor Brigade on the Western Front in 1914-15. I started off by asking David what was the state of the Indian Army at the beginning of World War I? It was the, the largest group of Empire troops outside Britain. There are probably just under 200,000 Indian troops. That you, We talk about two sorts of army in uh, India. There's the Indian Army, which is the one made up of, of locals, if you like, and the Army in India. And the army in India were British regiments, which were stationed there. There were about uh, 76,000 British troops serving in India at that time. The structure was that for each brigade, there will be three Indian battalions and one British battalion. And that was consistent throughout uh, the army in India. The way the army had been structured was due to Kitchener, who reformed the Indian army in 1895, when he was CNC in, in India. He dictated it would be a force recruited locally and permanently based in India, together with its expatriate officers. Now, the expatriate officers were actually, as it sort of implies, British officers. Normally, they were Sandhurst graduates. And in fact, it was considered to be quite prestigious to get a, a job in the Indian Army originally. But it was also considered to be a backwater. And you might ask yourselves, why did people do it if it got this sort of mixed well, to be a British Army officer was an expensive business. You had to pay for just about everything. Yeah, mess bills alone were probably more than your salary, right? Oh, absolutely right. And uh, But in India, it was cheaper. Quite a few of the very famous names uh, in the British Army got there. Each battalion and each company had Indian officers, officers of Indian ethnicity. They had to be from the right ethnic group for a particular company. They were really, really skilled, these people. They acted as the sort of advisors to the to the British and sort of solved issues within the company. Sometimes officers didn't know there'd been one, but the the senior Indian officer would have sorted it quietly. I suppose a bit like a company sergeant major might might operate in a an Indian, an English regiment, and each regiment had uh, a Rizaldar major, that's a cavalry senior rank, or a Subadar major, which is the infantry rank, and they worked their way down with different names for different ranks. When and why was the decision made to send them to Europe? Because presumably there was a bit of pushback against that. Like, how was that decision made, and what was the deciding factor? When Britain declared war on Germany on the 4th of August 1914, some people thought that that would cause an uproar in India because uh, there had been for some... Like years, a rebellion, you mean? Yes, yes. Because there was some, some unrest for a period of time before that when India were looking for independence. And instead of there being an uproar, there was a mass support and it was a mass support for the king emperor so it actually worked in the favor of, of britain uh and the viceroy uh lord harding he almost immediately pledged support for for britain and by offering the indian army they offered 
a cavalry and infantry corps, each with two divisions. And it was named Expeditionary Force A. It soon became known as the Indian Corps uh, by the time it arrived in Europe. Its head was going to be a chap called Sir James Wilcox. Kitchener had mixed feelings about Wilcox. Wilcox had got all this experience, but uh, Kitchener didn't think he was really ruthless enough, I suppose that's, that's the thing. And in fact, that when Kitchener had Hager CNC, it was the beginning of a very, very rough relationship between Haig and Wilcox. They didn't get on. And as time passed, that relationship really deteriorated. But we'll come to that later. There were the two Indian uh, infantry divisions was the Meerut and the Lahore Division. The Lahore Division is where the Feroz Sol Brigade is. They were made up of four brigades, as I've said. Each brigade made up of three Indian army regiments and one British regiment. The Feroz Sol Brigade which is, was the theme in the book, it had the Connaught Rangers was its British regiment. The 9th Bhopal Infantry, that was a mixed class regiment. That's where you had people of different religions in the different companies. The 57th Wild Frontier Regiment, which its name gives it away. It was used to working on the Khyber Pass and places like that. Yeah. Would that mainly have been like Pashto speakers from that area or would they have been yeah. recruited elsewhere? Yeah, it, it, it would be. Um, they were all based around Ferozapur. That's That was the headquarters, which is how it got its name as a division. And the fourth one was the Duke of Connaught's own Baluchis. They all, all four of them had distinguished histories. And, and what we must remember is that like the BEF, these Indian brigades were all regulars and all volunteers. Can you tell us when did they finally get to France and reach the Western Front, and and yeah. what were their what were their first experiences? They landed on the twenty sixth of September at Marseille, and when they got off at Marseille, they were cha- made to change rifles. Yes, because they the were rifle. a generation behind, weren't they? They were. Uh, that's that's to do with the rebellion. Yeah. There's always this idea, let's keep the Indian soldier a little bit behind the British soldier. According to Wilcox, he believed that uh, changing the rifles at that stage actually impaired their efficiency as soldiers because they were so used to, to to using the ones they used. In fact, some of them, they were thrust into battle so quickly that they hardly had any time to practice. And, it, and as, as you will know, when you get your rifle, you need to look at the sights and so on, and each one has its yeah. different, its little quirks. Mm, you need to zero it at the range, yeah, get it all, all sorted sort of for your eyes, and yeah. yeah. And some of them didn't have opportunity to do that, and they went. Their first stopping off point really well, was uh, Sir Cot, which is uh, close to uh, Orleans, and that's where they set up a camp, and they started to learn assault pr- practice. Because they weren't used to really charging emplacements. They were used to sort of the enemy popping out, having a shot and popping back. Um, and you sort of won battles in the kind of with your presence rather and blowing up places rather than proper battles. So they had to train them out, you know, how to do. They were also trained in basic things like doing, doing tensure, trenches, which uh, they had no real experience of but they were vital. And they were sent then, after those three weeks, to Messine. When they got there, they were just in time. The BEF had uh, fought major battles, uh, Mons, Lucato. And of course, remember, this is a very small, relatively group of professional soldiers. There were reserves, but they hadn't really been involved. And something like 16,000 of the BEF were either killed and wounded, and uh, two and a half thousand were taken prisoner. That was quite a percentage of the BEF. Huge. So the arrival of the Indians at that moment saved them, I think, 
So, David, did that mean then they got they got stuck straight in, did they? Like literally, you know, very they quickly. had their yeah, very they quickly. had their three weeks of training and then straight into the front yeah. line. Yeah, very, very quickly. And of course, it was a completely different environment to anything they'd they'd known. In spite of being fighting units originally, instead of sending most of them into the trenches, quite a few were, they were split up. They weren't in divisions, they were in battalions. So they would send one battalion to do this and another battalion to do mm. that. So sort of fed into the line in bits and pieces rather exactly. than as a formation. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's always a recipe for disaster and uh, broken yeah. morale, isn't it? But, well, it, it is. And and some of the jobs were sort of repairing roads, clearing spaces, and they were, they were attached to different bits. I mean, part of the Perazor Brigade were attached to, the, to Allenby's cavalry. And apparently they did very well. And when he wrote a letter back to their commanding officer, Edgerton, uh, he said, uh, they've done really well. I'm sending them back to you. Oh, oh, what's left of them? Which gives you an idea that, you know, the, the uh, casualties were high. Yeah. The real stars were their sappers and miners. And because of the nature of fighting um, in the Khyber and so on, they were used to extemporizing stuff. For example, uh, they were able to make their own hand grenade. They used to make them out of jam tins, apparently. And there was a fuse on them, and um, they were effective. But they worked really well. Uh, unfortunately, the command couldn't distinguish the fact that these were really skilled people and ought to be preserved rather than squandered. And the casualty rate was, was quite high. They were small companies. And in the end... Uh, Field Marshal French had to send out a, an order to remind the Indian officers, the British officers, and the British officers of other companies not to squander the lives of these men because they were almost irreplaceable. And so by the end of October, the Bhopals we've talked about, they lost five of their British officers killed or wounded, five Indian officers, 262 men killed and wounded. Their composition when they started was something like 900 men, uh, 17 British and 18 uh, Indian VCO officers. So that within a month, that's really quite significant ca casualties. Although there are quite a few left, and in fact, as time went on, casualties were such that they reduced the standard number of British officers and, and Indian officers attached to a, a battalion. They were really hard to replace. I'm sure. I mean, just finding the people who can speak the language in the first place must be a logistical nightmare. Yeah, it was. So what about awards? Well, it didn't take long before the first ever Indian recipient of the Victoria Cross earned his award. What's the story? Well, Sepoy or Private Kuro Khan, 31st of October, he was part of the Baluchis, uh, and they were fighting in an attempt to hold back a German attack at Holbeck. Well, the, the Germans were attacking, the Baluchis are trying to hold them off, and they were suffering heavy casualties. Uh, Kuro Khan was a machine gunner, uh, which is probably to, to flatter with the weapon he had. Uh, because they were old and obsolete. They, they were the... the, the oh, Indian. like an old Maxim gun or something. Yeah, or... exactly. So, and uh, in fact, one of the things that the um, Sappers and Miners has done was define a new tripod for them, because the ones they brought with them were not suitable for the sort of warfare they were fighting. Yeah. So he's, he's fighting with his group. There were two machine gun units with him. One is completely silenced, or everybody killed. Uh, Kudar Khan gets wounded, but he continues to fire. His machine gun unit is then overwhelmed, and everybody shot or bayoneted. Because he was wounded, there must have been blood and stuff round about him. They thought he was dead, and they left him. And the gun was 
was disabled as well through the attacks and could have canalised very quietly. He looked the like doggo, I think the Australians would call it. And when nightfall came, he crept back to join the rest of his battalion that hadn't been engaged in this particular fight. He was badly wounded. Uh, and thanks to that act of bravery and, and the other Baluchis that uh, were there, they delayed the German advance long enough the British and Indian reinforcements to come back and stop the advance. He was taken to England, which is what happened to very severely wounded, uh, in these early stages, severely wounded Indian soldiers, to the uh, Kitchener Hospital at Brighton, where he recovered. He was the first to actually to be awarded it. He wasn't the first to be presented with it because right. he was too ill to be presented. The one to be presented with it first was Darwin Singh Nagy, who was the, about in the Garwell Rifles, another uh, division. And he was presented with his uh, VC for acts almost a month later, 22nd, 23rd November. Um, and he received it on the 13th of December. Did these chaps, uh, well, especially Kuwadev Khan, did, did he survive and carry on fighting or was that the end of his he, war? He survived. Um, he, didn't, he didn't actually die until 1971. Oh, wow. So, uh, <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, medicine was quite remarkable, I think, given, given what he had. And I, I think these are two, two examples of Indians who have demonstrated. Remember, this is a private. He's not one of the Indian uh, Vaishwa's offices. Yeah. demonstrates they continue to fight without other officers or other superiors being there. Yeah, because this, was, this one... was one of the fears, wasn't it, yeah. David, that the Indians yeah. wouldn't be able to operate, yeah. you know, if their British officers yeah. got killed or whatever. But yeah. presumably stories like his and, and others yeah. prove that actually these guys were, yeah. were pretty switched on. Yes, I, I think so. It, it It's interesting that Wilcox, who really loved his, his Indian soldiers, really did, it was one of the, the issues between him and Kitchener later on. Um, he begged in, in his memoirs not to commission Indian soldiers in the British Army. Keep them as viceroy officers, inferior to a British officer, because they're not up to it. Mm. Now, this is a man who'd spent many, many years fighting alongside them, but he's still saying that. And therefore, it was a problem. However, inevitably, with casualty rates as they were, and the fact that um, the British officers of India regiments and British regiments as well were expected to be at the front, leading the men, because that's all part of the mystique of being a British officer to an Indian soldier. Look, they're so brave. Yeah, uh, It meant that the casualty rates amongst them was very high. And there's a, a, a really good example from our little group, the 57th uh, Wild Rifles. They were fighting at the Battle of Messine. And there were two companies involved. There were two companies, number four company. Uh, under British officers, of Captain Gordon, number two, uh, Major Barwell, number four. And there was also another uh, officer, a Lieutenant, a Lieutenant Molony. They, two, the captain and the major were killed and the lieutenant was wounded. This meant there was no British officer for these companies. However, the VCO officers involved took over command, fought a really good fighting withdrawal and the organised an advance, a counterattack. That's without any British officer being there. So what that demonstrates to me is that if when the chips are down and when necessity calls upon it, they can do it. Yeah. Well, um, well we've 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 spoken there, uh, David, about the strengths of the Indian units and that actually they could operate without British officers when required and they could hold their own. But there were some downsides, wasn't there? I believe there were some issues around morale, uh, you know, self-inflicted wounds, things yeah. like this. 
Yeah, m morale was an issue. There was two particular features about being an Indian soldier. One was Izat, and the other was Rizat. Izat was your duty to be a good soldier and to fight and so on. Rizat was in return what your employees, British, would do for you. And there was a thought amongst some, and it wasn't many, that if you got injured, you would go back home. Even if it was a minor wound? Even if it was a minor wound. Particularly if that minor wound was something that prevented you from being an effective soldier. So there was precedent for this throughout the sort of history of the Br British Indian yeah, Army. Yeah, that's, so that's when they were fighting in India, if you got wounded and you weren't effective as a soldier anymore, you were sent back and you fulfilled your duty and your employer had fulfilled his contract. So, so when they actually found what the conditions were like, far different from anything they experienced, it's not surprising they were frightened to death. Some of them. And there is a story that um, they deliberately injured themselves, usually the left hand. Yeah. Now, you need two hands to fire a rifle. You could, or your trigger finger, that was damaged, made it difficult to use the rifle. And it was clear that some did do that. And they believed that, you know, because they're now injured, they will be sent home. You know, they were not effective as soldiers. Um, and there was a big outcry. There was a lot of rumours. And in my view, it ha certainly happened. How many is a different matter. Um, there was also contrary evidence that it really wasn't very many. Uh, there was a chap, um, Peaton. Seaton, rather, who was at uh, the Kitchen Hospital I mentioned. And he took uh, a thousand cases of injuries to examine to see whether there was evidence of self-inflicted wounds here. And of the thousand, he found six that might be. Cut the long story short, there was certainly some of it. And uh, five Indian soldiers were executed as a result of it. It sort of put an end to it for a while. And of course, the other thing is uh, desertions. Yes. Did Indian soldiers desert? Well, they had a problem. It's very difficult for them to meld into the background, isn't it? If you think about it, we were a bit different. Yeah, you can't really hide in the local uh, bar in the, in the village, can no, you? You, you can't. stand out a bit. You can't. No, and you were a long way away from your family that you might want to get to. And we know there were desertions in the British Army. Um, so I don't think desertion was a very big issue. However, there was one particular uh, example of de de desertions, uh, quite an interesting one. Um, he was a member of the Vaughan's Rifles. He was called Mir Mast, M-I-R-M-A-S-T. He was the brother of Mir Dast. Mir Dast won the VC. Mir Mast was an Afridi, which meant that his actual nationality was Afghani. He was right. So they're from the border know. region, are they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, he and about 14 or 15 others deserted to the Germans. Um, and he deserted because the Germans made a big ploy about... Uh, the Turks being attacked by the British in Mesopotamia. And the Turks being Muslim brothers. Muslim, exactly. There's a lot yeah. of, of that. Come and join your Muslim brothers. Um, for the majority, it just didn't work. They just, most of the Indian Muslims on the front just laughed. Uh, and so they gave up. But but Mir Mast thought it was a, a good idea. And he took about 14 or 15 of his friends yeah. with him. It was reported that he was given the Iron Cross. Uh, but he wasn't. He was given a lower award. And that was for his efforts to try and get the Emir of Afghanistan to support the Germans to enable an invasion of India 
Right. Uh, so that the the Indian are you going to recall the Indian troops back because India is now threatened and so so that's the that's the real story of desertion. Well, I think the the battle most people associate with the Indian Corps in the First World War is the place where the big Indian memorial is, which I was lucky enough to visit. Uh, is of course Neuve Chapelle. Um, yeah. Big battle, I think it was March 1915. Yeah. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of the the Corps' involvement in that battle yeah. and, and what their role was? Yeah, of course, you're quite right. It's There was this reorganisation of, of the army beforehand to get ready. And Neuve Chapelle was possibly when the British army first went on the offensive. It had been very much defensive, trying to stop the Germans, pushing them to the sea. And uh, the Meirut and the Lahore Division, Lahore Division is where the Ferrosso Brigade is, um, their role was to use their artillery to fire at the German front lines. It was going to be a 30-minute uh, bombardment. 30-minute uh, for surprise, but also I'm sure that, that you've heard and, and the listeners will have heard of the shell shortage crisis we, we just were not industrialized back in britain at the time we not weren't making enough shells for artillery um and this is we were using cannon at a rate that we never ever used them before so 30 minutes then uh the garwell brigade which was uh not the one that we we're interested in they started to advance supported by the 3rd Battalion of the London Regiment. Um, part of the reorganisation of the uh, brigades was that they were strengthened by reserve regiments from Britain. The Indian right, T TA units, essentially. Yeah. yeah, that's because of the casualties. You know, the, the numbers in each company and each division and so on was being reduced. So 3rd London Regiment, it really was a good advance. But two of the Indian companies drifted off instead of going like that they went like that what that meant was that the line that they were supposed to be attacking wasn't being attacked and they were also bunching up so there was some confusion the german line that wasn't being attacked they had time to reinforce it and therefore they could enfilade fire at the groups coming up so that if you can imagine two lines advancing in one direction but missing out the bit in between which was populated by more german soldiers who could fire at them uh, very high rate of casualties very high rate especially amongst the british officers in the the indian thing and therefore again the indian officers were forced to take over which they did very well uh that gap enable the the germans to reinforce it and then to launch a, a counterattack and a few from the uh british regiments from first scottish uh they were in the derridan brigade um in the Meirut division they were able to form a little resistance group uh and withdrew, withdrew quite well. French, Field Marshal French, thought this had been a successful attack. Uh, and while fighting stopped at the end of the day, the Germans were able to reinforce their trenches. Just remember, they were out where the British were, the Germans were out outnumbering them very heavily. And then counterattack. And... They had to pause the second day because casualty rates were so high. Uh, the Ferrisso Brigade, they'd spent the, the day of the battle in their billets, 10 miles from the front. Uh, that was because that's where Foch, the, the German, uh, sorry, the French Field Marshal, had said they ought to be. Uh, and on the 11th, they were ordered to relieve the Meirut division, which had carried out the attack. And they got more close to the front line. 
Haig thought he was winning. And on the 12th, he ordered Wilcox to push forward the Indian Corps towards the enemy, quote, no matter what the cost. And I think this is probably an indication of that stage where Haig's starting to realise it's going to be a battle of attrition. And if you kill, this is a, a very simplified bit of simplification. If you kill one German and it costs you two British, that's okay. A real, yep. a real war of attrition. So the whole division was ordered to advance, but the brigade itself, the assault brigade, was to remain in reserve. Uh, then it was ordered also to advance. So you've now got the whole of the division. Uh, marching towards Neuve Chapelle, and Edgerton, who commanded the first Soul Brigade, was given command of all the brigades involved, all the German brigades. He was expected to relaunch this attack on the 12th, but when he looked at the state of the troops who had been involved, and also the distance that the ones that hadn't been involved had to travel to get there, um, which would mean that the start time would be delayed, which gave the Germans time to repair and surprise was lost. He believed that this was not going to be an effective attack. He discussed it with uh, Wilcox. Wilcox agreed. And then took um, a brave or foolish step for a, a, an officer. He called it off. Which oh, wow. did not without end. without Haig say so. Without Haig say so. Now I hinted at the beginning that there was a bit of disdain uh, between Haig and, and Wilcox. Uh, Wilcox um, said that um, his men were very precious. You can imagine that Haig was not best pleased. There had been a lot of casualties and very little gain. I think it was about a thousand yards or something like that for a lot of lives. And he believed that a Wilcox was too friendly, in inverted commas, with his men. They were part of his big family. And to Wilcox, it seemed as though he was sending his relatives to certain death. And in fact, there'd been discussions between Haig and Wilcox where Wilcox had said previously, before the reorganisation, uh, that, that we're almost dead. We can't fight anymore. Uh, and it didn't, uh, that again didn't endear him to Haig. No. Uh, so the battle run at about a thousand yards. Uh, Indian Corps, 63 British and Indian officers. 42 of those were British. Uh, 772 killed. of the rank killed. Uh, 772 of the ranks killed. Um, nearly 3,000 of the ranks wounded half of which were Indians, uh, and Wilcox and Harding were pleased with the gallantry, but lamented the loss. Um, so Haig uh, wrote a very interesting compliment. He praised them. That this was probably a political thing because Harding was powerful. He praised the bravery and the contribution of the Indians, but pointed out that the job they've been given was much easier than the job that the British soldiers have been given. Oh, wow. So a bit of a... You can see that Haig is not best pleased with the Indians and beginning to, I think, undervalue their contribution. Uh, there, there was also, at the Second Battle of Ypres, had a lot of casualties there. The counterattack involved the Ferrisol Brigade, uh, and more gas was used. The only defence they had was to uh, get their puggeries, which is the the, the hats, really. Like a turban, yeah. Yeah, pee on them, and yeah. then hold them to your nose, and apparently that had some effect. Mm. Uh, not the most pleasant thing to do, uh, and no. not good for morale, I would have thought. Um, but uh, again, lots of British officers killed. Uh and French redone again. Real the Connaughts and the Baluchis 
and uh, the 57s managed to form a small group and resist. And they managed to hold the Germans back so the line didn't completely collapse, but they were forced to withdraw. But again, the need for more reinforce, uh, reinforcements from India. And each time these reinforcements came, they were of inferior quality. But there's only a limited number of people you can recruit in, in the circumstances in India. And there was no call up. Yeah. So it had to be volunteers. And all those so, back home said, we're getting killed, we're getting hurt. They're not they're not agreeing to to send us home when we get injured. Would that help help you recruit? Would you want to go and join those? No. So there yeah. we are. So they've had they've had this big battle at Neuve Chapelle, they've been involved yeah. at the second battle of Ypres. Yeah. Um when was the decision made to withdraw them and why? Well, um, they still still kept on fighting and they went into uh, Festerberg, of course, and as well. So when do we withdraw them? There was a lot of talk. Kitchener uh, had been visiting Wilcox and had told Wilcox that it was his, his intention to keep the Indian Corps on the Western Front. In spite of all the difficulties, Kitchener thought that they were worth keeping there. I, th I suspect this was because the Kitchener battalions that he had set up the recruiting system for weren't quite ready to come. No. And there still wasn't the conscription. July 1915, a new restructuring. Uh, Massive reorganisation. Um, the newcomers were not as good as the old ones. It was They had all the same problems. They then fought at the Battle of Luz. First line stalled. Uh, French resigned. And Haig took over. I've already said that Haig and Wilcox were not on the best of terms. So you've now got Haig, Commander-in-Chief of the BF. That limitation of the family system that I've talked about really was impacting now because the officers that were, that were coming in didn't know the men at all. The men didn't know themselves either because they were coming from different linked battalions and so on. They were not as effective. And on the 31st of October 1915, uh, the whole corps was told it needs to prepare to depart to Marseille, which is an indication that you're leaving France. Ninth Corps took over their front line. I said that the Cavalry Corps were told that they were going to remain because of Haig's disillusionment or Ill illusion that uh, there might be suddenly a big cavalry battle. Anybody who knows anything about the British Army and the early... Uh, uh, 20th, late 19th century knows there was a big argument about were cavalry mounted infantry or were they people who ran at you with swords and lances. Big debate. But Haig still thought there would be a sword and lance type of advance. And of course, he kept, therefore, the Indian cavalry, who had been almost unscathed compared with the infantry. Uh, the first sword brigade boarded trains on the 8th of November and reached Marseille on the 12th of November. They arrived in Egypt on the 22nd of December. It must have been quite clear, certainly to the British and probably to the Indian officers, that they were being asked to leave because they were not functioning properly anymore. Was it like being substituted in a big football match, kind yeah. of that sort of feeling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Particularly if you've not performed that well. Yeah. In the eyes of the tra the trainer, the manager, or whoever, yeah. so I think I think there was that, but there was also relief because they were going to somewhere where the fighting was not as intense, yeah. uh, and it was also in a climate they were more used to, and um, I I think particularly the ones who had not been in France very long and had not got used to the the bloodiness of the fighting there. This was a relief. And it was nearer home. 
And that's a, that's one of the important reasons because it was easy to reinforce troops from India if they were in Egypt than if they were in France. Distance was much, much less. Yeah. And also it was a vital role. Protecting the Suez Canal, which was the main, as we know, it can, you know, we've got troubles now with it, haven't we? And the effects yeah. that can have on on the economy and transport and so on. It was a proper job. Um and they spent their, their time there. But they didn't they some of them stayed there, some of them moved on. And you mustn't think, and I'm sure you don't, but no one must think. That was the end of the Indian contribution to the First World War. Uh, there were six, seven uh, Indian expeditionary forces. Gallipoli is probably the most well-known contribution uh, that they did. Uh, East was Africa, also, they were there. Well, I was going to say, East, there were two IEFs in East Africa. Um, Sinai and Palestine. And, right, also, yep. there, and also there was a, another raid on the Suez Canal that uh, a particular group was sent. So that's that's really the end of the Indians on the, the Western Front, or the Indian infantry on the Western Front. Yeah. Well, David, before we, before we wrap up, I'd love to know what's your sort of assessment of the Corps on, on the Western Front in 1914-15? Do you feel they did a good job and that we should, re, you know... Um, you know, that their, their contribution should be more discussed than it is? Or do you feel that actually they had some problems and things didn't go well, or a bit of both? I think it's a bit of both. So let, let's have a look at how they've been criticised. And I, I think there were about six criticisms. The first of all was that they were inferior to British troops in the first place. However, like Indian troops... In the BF, at the start, they were professional soldiers. Most of them had had years of experience, like the BF. They were experts with the weapons they had. Weapons were inferior, but they knew how to use them. Uh, they were very clever at improvisation, as I, I've mentioned, in a way that perhaps the British weren't quite so clever. But their Previous experience was very different. They were fighting in hills and valleys and against tribes who very rarely ever came out for pitch battles. Uh, probably there had been a handful of pitch battles since the mutiny. Second thing was this reliance on British officers that we've talked about. They were to a degree because they were expected to be. But I think when the chips were down, there were enough examples of them being able to command themselves and organise themselves. And as we saw with the first VC winner, when the chips are down, even the private can show initiative and, and bravery and courage. They couldn't cope with the European climate. It was assessed. That first winter, uh, 1914, was particularly bad. But as, as I said, uh, they were sent in summer uniforms. Uh, and the followers were sent with no uniform at all. You know, they were just wearing what they could wear. A lot of them would look like Gandhi, the, the stuff they were wearing. So it's not surprising that it was a bit cold. It was also very wet in spring. Very, very wet. A bit like in England now. So um, it was something they were not used to. However, a lot of them had fought in the Khyber which was very cold, where the climate was bad. They had the monsoons. So I really don't think it's fair to say that they couldn't stand the climate. And, and I've mentioned the one size fits all. So even when they got uniforms, they weren't necessarily the right ones. Fourth criticism then, they couldn't stand bombardments. They certainly were not used to it. They were, the enemies that they fought, as a rule, didn't have any artillery. So the bombard having to stand there while your trench is shelled was something they never ever had to experience. I think it also came as a shock to the British. Uh, people who want to compare the British uh, unfavorably with the German uh, with the Indians will tell you well they've experienced this in the Boer War. Uh, 
you know, they did do some trench warfare, they did do some bombardment, but this was on a very small scale. And you've got to remember that was 12 years before. So how many of the, the British troops in the BF had fought the Boer yeah. War and not retired? And a couple of a couple of long toms is not quite the same as a German bombardment. Oh, absolutely. Right? Uh, absolutely. So you could you could say that uh, there was some evidence of that. Uh, and possibly some evidence that some of the British soldiers found it equally challenging. Um, I think they were a bit slower to learn not to expose themselves in the same way, to, to keep away from the front, because, uh, as you know, front trenches were very likely manned. It was reserve trenches where the bulk were. And it, I think it took the Indians time to, to realise that was the way to operate. So there might be some business about that. Moral fibre and self-wounding? Yeah, well, there was some self-wounding. Um, there was some desertion, but not on a massive scales. And you could argue that the family nature actually kept people's morale up because they were with people who they regarded as family rather than some strangers. Um, there were desertions on all sides. Um, and as, as you know, there was all the business about lack of moral fibre uh, in, in the British Army and cowardice and, and so on. Um, relatively small numbers. And I think the same applies probably to the Indians. And it's also the difference between the, the is that my duty, or is that your responsibility to me? which probably didn't actually exist in the same sort of way in the British Army. Individual divisions were failures. Um, they'd not had the same sorts of experience as the British Army. Uh, the BEF had been fought to a standstill when the, when the Indians came by the Germans. There were some successes and some failures. So I think on the whole... Given the parameters under which they were organised, equipped and sent to the Western Front, they were very successful. Had they not been there, and I think this is probably the, the, the real crux, had they not been there, the BF would probably have been pushed right back to the sea. And the First World War might well have been a lot shorter than it was.